Let's begin in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this time. We're thankful that we have this opportunity. We're thankful for prayer. As we come before you this morning, we're thankful, Father, for our lives. We're thankful for all the blessings that we have and for so many blessings that we have inside of Christ. We're thankful, Father, that we can come to you in prayer. And we remind ourselves at this time, Father, to never neglect prayer, to come to you when we need advice, to come to you when we need strength, to come to you when we're hurting, but also, Father, even when things are great, to come to you. We're thankful, Father, for your listening ear to your people. We come before you this morning with a number of those that we know for Brownie Woodard as she's been in NHC and we pray, Father, that after her fall she will continue to recover and continue to grow stronger. And we pray, Father, that things will continue to go well, that she may go home tomorrow. We pray for Knox Callahan as he's at home sick and we pray, Father, for his family as they're with him and we, we pray, Father, that as he's had strep and may have a few other issues going on that all will be well and will be remedied very soon. We pray, Father, also for those that we don't know of at this time. We're so thankful, Father, to be able to know about those that we need to pray, but we know at the same time there are a number of people that are dealing with issues that we never know about. But we're confident, Father, as we're here this morning that you know about them. And we pray, Father, that all of those that are hurting will be comforted and all of those that have needs that they will be met. We pray, Father, that as we're here this morning, as we engage in our Bible class, that we'll be thankful for our time to look into the scriptures, and that as we study this morning, we'll be encouraged and we will be motivated throughout our week. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We are not in our series this morning. The Bible doesn't say that for one purpose. I didn't want to start it back up for one week and then be gone next week for a gospel meeting. So we're going to have an individual class that will be on the screen here in just a minute, and we'll go through that class looking at some things about Jesus and looking at some things that we need to know about Jesus in our lives. I want you to turn with me to John 15. That's where we're going to start. So we will pick back up in our regular Sunday morning class um, in just a few weeks, but we will not have that this week. I didn't want to start and stop and start and stop. So that'll put us back on our regular schedule here soon. Go with me to John 15. I want you to see something in John 15. I want you to start with me in verse 1. John 15, verse 1, because we learn something about Jesus in John 15, especially in verse 1. Listen to what he says. I am the true vine. Now pause with me the first part of verse 1. If Jesus says, I am the true vine, what do we understand from that statement? Well, number one, we understand that he is the true vine. But what do we also understand from that statement? There are false vines. If there is truth, there is error. If there is good, there is evil. Jesus begins in this particular discourse by saying, I am the true vine. And listen to what he says in the rest part, rest of verse 1. And my father is the husbandman. Verse 2, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth forth fruit, or bringeth forth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? What is Jesus trying to tell us here? He's the vine that makes us what? The fruit producers. Or or what? Those that produce no fruit. And go back to verse 1. I am the true vine. If you are going to produce fruit in your life, I'm talking about in your spiritual life, in your Christianity, in your walk toward eternity, who must you be connected to? The true vine, and that is Jesus. You follow on, he keeps telling some things about this and about how it's going to be, about how the Father is to be glorified, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified. How do you give glory to the Father that's in heaven? You be a fruit producer. Now, I know, as you do, that is a number of things. This morning, are you producing fruit? 
The answer is yes. What have you done this morning? Well, you came to church. There, there's, a, there's a real simple one this morning. You are producing fruit in your life by making a study of God's Word a priority. Jesus is the vine, right? We're studying the words of Jesus. When you study the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of Peter, and of Paul, you're studying the words of Jesus, John 14, 26 through 29. You're producing fruit. How else have you produced fruit in your life this morning? Did you pray? As you know, prayer is actually a command of God. You're producing fruit. There are a number of things that we will do that we will produce fruit from. We're going to worship here soon. What is that? It's a fruit production. By the way, let me, let me tell you something about worship. Who did we come to worship? We need to remember that. Who did we come to worship? We are not the worshipped, we are the worshippers. We need to be reminded of that. And he says, in doing these things, in providing these fruit, in knowing who we're supposed to be, in knowing without the Lord we can't do anything, verse 8, we glorify the Father. And he goes on and says in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now, look at verse 10. I'm going to read verse 10, and I want you to pick out the most important word of verse 10. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. What's the most important word of John 15, 10? If. If. You go back to verse 1. I am the true vine. Indicate something to us. There are false vines. You go down to verse 10. If you keep my commandments. Oh, I'm getting it now, aren't we? If I want to produce fruit, what do I have to do? I've got to know and keep the commandments of God. Verse 10 tells me something in the very beginning. If you keep my commandments means I've got to know them. If you keep my commandments, but the word if. How many of you this morning, by raise of hands, this is yes, this is no. How many of you this morning were forced to come to Bible class? If. If we were in worship, we could ask the same question. How many of us were forced to come to worship? This morning when you prayed, how many of us were forced to pray? If. How many of you lived the Christian life this week? How many of you were forced to live the Christian life in the past seven days? If you keep my commandments. God's not going to force us to do anything. By the way, start in the book of Genesis and read all the way through the, through the book of Revelation. And ask a question as you read through. What has God forced man to do? What has God forced man to do? Nothing. Remember in the garden? There's a tree and it's fruit. If you'll allow me to paraphrase, what did God say? Leave it alone. You've had to be real direct with your children. <laughs> Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't eat it. Leave it alone. Why? Because the end result is, is death. Did God force them to leave it alone? You go and you look at all the figures of the Old Testament, both small and great. Did God force them to do anything? You go to the New Testament. Let's pick two from the New Testament. They're two big ones. Let's look at Peter. Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me. When you see that Peter denied his Lord the third time, what happened to Peter? He went away and wept bitterly. Why? Because he was to be blamed. Look at Saul before he becomes Paul. He was traveling on a trip, a journey. His cohorts were with him, and he was blinded by a light. He was told to go into the city, and it would be told him what he must do. He goes into the city. A man tells him what he must do. He obeys. Did God force him to obey? 
no more than he forces us to obey or disobey. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my, fa- in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I spoke to you, that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Do you want to live a happy life? Follow Jesus. Why? Because Jesus cares. Look with me at verse 13. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life, and look at these last two words real carefully, for his friends. You ever wondered if Jesus cares? Have you ever wondered if Jesus knows who you are? Have you ever wondered if you're just one in billions? You're not. You never will be. Matter of fact, he summarizes this up with us, and it's a verse we know in John 15, 14. By the way, it's the same in John 14, 15. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. By the way, that's a theme of John chapter 15, following the commandments of Jesus. I want us this morning to understand that Jesus cares. And I want to do so by way of four different scenes where Jesus interacts with people and Jesus is doing a variety of different things that will help us understand that he cares. Let's look at his teaching. We're going to look at something I call his ability. We're going to look at something that I've called his walking. And then finally, I want to look at something that's called his sacrifice. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Some of these will be in the book of Matthew, others will not. But we will begin in Matthew chapter 6. I want you to go down with me toward the end of that chapter. I want you to go down to verse 25. That's where we're going to pick up in just a moment. Chapter 6 starts in a really interesting way. Take heed that you do not your alms to be seen of them, of men. Do not be religious for earthly gain. Do not be religious for earthly gain. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed. Warning. It's the sign on the interstate. It's a sign on the road. Bridge out. Take heed. That you don't do these things before men. Otherwise, verse 1, you have no reward of your father. He goes on, verse 5, and talks about prayer. When you pray, don't be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue. Now, is Jesus saying we cannot have public prayer? No. What is Jesus saying? Well, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't, verse 1, don't do your religious service, don't do your religious requirements so that other people can say, you are so good. Because otherwise you have your reward, even in prayer. He goes on and talks about fasting. We don't talk about fasting very often. How many of you have ever fasted before? Fasting's not a requirement. None of y'all have ever fasted before. Let me tell you a secret. You already know that me either. But in this time we're reading about, this was something people did as an act of personal sacrifice and priority as they look toward God. Verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Why? Because if you do, you already have your reward. What happens in the earth? Verse verse 19, well, moth and rust does what? Corrupt. Are things permanent in this world? All it takes is a little storm. And then your earthly possessions can be no more. We learned that last night, didn't we? That's all it takes. All it takes is a simple moth. How dangerous is a moth? To a good suit? Tragic. How dangerous is water? Need water, don't we? How dangerous is it to that frame under your car? Or that metal siding on your home? 
How dangerous is it to meddle? Why, it's rusting, isn't it? Why do you lock the doors on your home? Why do we have locks on the church building? Well, keep reading. Where thieves break through and steal. I had to do something I haven't done ever in my life last night. I broke into my neighbor's house. After everything that happened, my neighbor locked herself out of her house last night. Been a, had to get creative to break into the house. It's possible. Wasn't that hard either. Hmm. Where, where thieves break through and steal. What's Jesus telling you, chapter 6? This earthly life is not permanent, nor is it satisfactory. Keep reading verse 25 down to the bottom. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What shall you put, it, put, put on? Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Or why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Pause with me there. What's he trying to teach us? What is Jesus trying to teach us? Beginning in verse 24. Matter of fact, the whole chapter is about this theme. Verse 24, or verse, specifically verse 25. Take no thought for your life. What does that mean? Does he mean let yourself go? Well, well no. Yeah. He illustrates it on out as he tells us not to worry. Behold how the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap. Now, I love this one. Nor gather into barns. You ever seen a bird build a barn? I've never seen a bird barn, have you? I've seen a bird build a nest. That's all I've ever seen a bird build. I've seen a bird place in its nest eggs. And mama bird protect those eggs. One has been on my front porch light. They, are now, they have now flown the nest, thank goodness, because she hated me every time I came out the front door. But yet, who took care of them? They didn't have a barn. They didn't sow seed. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? How much more are we than the animals of this world? Are you an animal or are you a created being of God? You are much more than an animal. And verse 27 is a little, a little touchy for me. Which one of you can, just by thinking of it, add to your height? I've been thinking about it for a long time. I've shrunk. Isn't that what happens? My driver's license used to say 5'11". It now says 5'9". I know they just messed up once. But how many of you can add to your height. How many of you when you are sick can think the sickness away? By the way, we've, we've had a mind eye view of that in the last year. How many of us could think a virus away? Prayed about it a lot, didn't we? For whatever reason, God chose to leave it here. I don't know what that reason is yet. I don't know that we'll ever know. But how many of us can think a sickness away? When we think about our clothing, our raiment, verse 28, he brings us to the field. How many of you like to see the flowers in a field? Oh, beautiful, huh? Willard does. Willard, how many flowers have you planted in your lifetime? A 
a lot. <laughs> he says, I say unto you that even Solomon in all his array, Solomon most likely will go down in history as the richest man of the earth. And there are people competing for that. We don't know what the translation is. But he had everything. He had money. He had power. He had wealth. He had fame. He had it all. And yet what does God say? The lilies of the field had it better than him. Don't think about it anymore. Verse 30, Wherefore God, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Oh, now we get it. Jesus gets out and says it. O ye of little faith. When Jesus taught, his intention was to build you up. Who knows John 3, 17? Who knows John 3, 16? All right, everybody, who knows John 3, 17? He came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. O oh, ye of little faith, build it up. Why are you here? What's your purpose? He tells us, thus he says, verse 34, And therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? Now pause with me, verse 31. Is he saying, I can't ask what's for lunch? A lot of wives would love if the Lord would say, You can't ask what's for lunch. I've already asked last night. Anybody else? Got to be one person in this room that asks what's for lunch tomorrow. Is he saying you can't ask what's for lunch? No. When the earthly is the only thing that we see, when the earthly is the only thing that consumes all of our thoughts, we don't see God and we miss Him. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we be clothed with? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth, and ye have no need of all things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought therefore tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What was Jesus trying to teach? You may summarize it in a short little easy sentence. That's right. That's right. Here's how I summarize chapter 6. Heaven's worth it. Heaven's worth it. If you follow the teachings of Jesus, you will find yourself in heaven. Number two, I want you to move with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. And I want you to see... His ability. His ability. First Peter chapter 5. Pick up with me in verse 7. Now verse 7, in my opinion, is the key to the book. Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 is the key to First Peter. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Does Jesus care? Well, yes, he cares. And he asks us over and over and over by himself and by others to cast all of our problems, all of our worries, all of our fears, where? On him. Why? Because he cares for, listen to this, listen to the word that's used, you. That is much different than he cares for us. It means the same thing, but look at how it's worded. He cares for who? You. Now, keep reading. This is what we find out. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may, may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Pause with me. What's this got to do with God? What's this got to do with Jesus? Well, let me show you. Verse 7, go down to verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, 
establish, strengthen, and settle you to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. What's his ability? If you look at verse 10, the God of all grace, that's the Father, who called us unto his eternal glory by who? Christ Jesus. Because what happens to us in this life? Now listen to the way he puts it. Listen to the way he puts it because this is important. After that you have suffered for a while. You ever had to tell someone, maybe you were going in a trip in the car. And someone from the back seat asked, are we there yet? How much longer? I used to be the king of that. And I have found that what goes around comes around. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Used to also tell my parents, well, can't you just write a check? Now my son says, can't you just use your card? Mm, that's full circle. What do you, how do you try to explain those trips? How, how long is it going to be? It's going to be a little while. It means it's just going to be short. That's what we mean by that statement. It's not going to be forever. It's just going to be a little bit. Listen to what we're told through divine revelation about this life during its tribulations. It's just for a little while. Why do I know it's only going to be just for a little while? Because of the one who is sent by the God of all grace, of whom we are saved through. That is Christ Jesus. And verse 11, here is the reality. Don't miss this one. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Who's going to rise up and be better than God? Who's going to rise up and be more glorious than Jesus? Who's going to, be more, who's going to rise up and be more informative than the Holy Spirit? And when we answer that question, in truth, will know his ability. Who's going to rise up and be better than him? Well, you start in the book of Genesis. One tried to rise up, didn't he? What do we call him? The devil. Oh, now it's coming clear. Verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, what's his name? The devil. What's he want to do? As a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. But what, what does God do? He says, after you've been in tribulation, after you've, you, you've experienced a little while, the God of all grace through Jesus Christ will comfort you. And he will have dominion. He will have glory forever and ever. What's his ability? It's non Ending. Let's see his walking. Go back with me to the book of John as you follow the New Testament. Go with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now John 11, as you know, is a very, very intimate scene. You start off in verse 1 of John 11. Now a certain man was sick. Pause with me there. I want to ask a few questions about this man. We know who he is based off of verse 5. Really based off of verse 3 and 2. Why was this man sick? Why was he sick? Why was he sick? Why, why do you get sick? A certain man was sick. His name was Lazarus of Bethany in the town of Mary and his sister Martha. And it was Mary that anointed the Lord of the ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. You think this family knew who Jesus was? Let me tell you, have you ever wiped the feet of your Lord with your hair? You know what that was? It was an act of submission. Submission of will. 
And this man was sick. Now go with me down to verse 36. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Part truth. That's a part truth. Okay, sometimes we get in trouble with part truths. Could Jesus have saved Lazarus? Oh, yeah, he could have. Were miracles ever used for selfish personal gains? No, they weren't. Because that was not their purpose. What was their purpose? We're about to see it here in a minute. What was the purpose of miracles? To prove that Jesus Christ was who? Son of God. Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which, which came with her. And he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And Jesus said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, now this is, this is interesting terminology to me. Lord, come and see. We see that phrase inside of scripture. Sometimes when you used to say, come and see about the Lord. But now the Lord is being told, come and see about Lazarus. And then verse 35 One of the most interesting passages of Scripture that's only two English words. Jesus wept. What I'm trying to get you to see here is the walking Jesus did when Lazarus died. You go back to the beginning of this chapter and you see about the man Lazarus. And you go on and read about what's happening and Jesus finds out that he was sick and, and Jesus begins coming to her Jesus begins coming to him, and Jesus makes it there, and guess what? He weeps. There are many occasions where Jesus weeps. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, you'll remember. When he looked at Jerusalem and saw that the whole city had been given over to idolatry. I can't answer this question. It's one that plagues me, and, and you, you can't answer it either, and, and now it can plague you. Does Jesus weep today? I can think of reasons that Jesus could weep. Jesus could look at creation today, all of the world, and what would he see? Sin and sorrow and suffering. Jesus could look at his church. Does the church make Jesus weep? Jesus told a group via the book of Revelation, I will spew you out of my mouth. I'm sure those were words that were not easy to say or hear. When Jesus looks at his individual people, we go back to 1 Peter 5, casting your care upon him for he cares for you. When he looks at us as individuals, do we give him cause to weep? Probably. Probably. And he wept. Verse 36, the Jews said, Behold how he loved him. Verse 37, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind cause that even this man should have not died? Even the world was asking the same question that Mary was asking. Lord, if you'd only been here, he would not have died. Jesus, as he makes his way to the tomb, says, Take away the stone. Verse 43, we read these words, Lazarus, come forth. It was Marshall Keeble who said the reason he said Lazarus come forth instead of just come forth was because if he said come forth, every person in the grave would have come forth. And that's true. But I want you to see Jesus walking upon this earth, dealing with the same pains and sorrows as us, and he cares. Now, I want you to see this just for a minute. Uh, John eleven thirty five. 35, why did Jesus weep? Why did Jesus weep? Well, I believe there's two answers. Number one, I believe it's because Jesus' friend died. But number two, Jesus knew that his friend was going to die again. 
You ever thought about that? Lazarus did not just die once. I guess if anyone it can be said of, it's Lazarus. He was prepared for his death the second time. He had seen it. No one else has seen it. But Jesus walked with that family, and he walks with us. Go with me to Matthew 26. Let's see his sacrifice. Matthew 26. I just want you to read some words with me. Because I believe they are powerful words. Matthew 26, just, just pick up with me in verse 36 and, and just read with me for a bit. Sometimes I think we commentate in class too much. Just read with me. Then comes Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. And then he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Just be here, he said. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he comes unto the disciples and finds them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now pause with me there. How long had Jesus prayed? You could not watch with me for... All right, there's the answer. Now what words did Jesus pray? Very short, weren't they? I wonder how many times that had been repeated in that moment. I don't know. Watch and pray, verse 41, and enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus understands our physical limitations. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. Pause with me, verse 43. Have your eyes ever been heavy? Oh, yeah. Sometimes our eyes are heavy after a long day. And sometimes our eyes are heavy at the most inopportune times. Have your eyes ever been heavy in this room? It's okay. Me too. We understand physical limitations and so does Jesus. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So he goes and prays again. He finds their eyes heavy. Verse 44, And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. I wonder how many hours he prayed. I know the first time he prayed an hour. Let's just pre-adventure for a minute. He prayed one hour each time. He prayed three times, so he prayed for three hours. Now, I'm not saying that's how, many, how much time he prayed, but, but I do know he at least prayed for an hour. Now, this is a personal question. Don't answer this aloud, but have you ever prayed for an hour? You see the intense grief, the heaviness, the sorrow of his sacrifice. What, what, what was getting ready to happen after Matthew 26? Matter of fact, what's getting ready to happen after his third prayer? Who's coming? Judas. Judas. Jesus just had a meal with Judas and said, you're going to betray me. And yet he still had a meal with him. And yet he goes to that prayer knowing that Judas is already at work. Matter of fact, he said during that meal, you're already at work. And he was. And in this prayer, he says, not my will, but yours. Not the will of me, but the will of the Father. Jesus did not just sacrifice upon the cross. Jesus sacrificed well before the cross. Verse 45, he comes to the disciples. He, he said to them, sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
Rise and let's be going. Behold, he that is at hand doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas. And as Paul Harvey would say, yeah, we know what he would say. We know that from this point on in Matthew 26, after his prayer was his last moment of freedom in this physical life. And yet, he pressed forward. His teachings, his followers, his walking, his sacrifice, all connect us back to John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater left hath no man than this, than a man, or that a man lay down his life, now listen to this again, for his friends. Let me tell you, Jesus cares. And Jesus cares for you, and he cares for me, he cares for this world, but he cares what we do. We're not going to be perfect. Scripture proves that to us, doesn't it? The very first two individuals, Adam and Eve, were they perfect? It goes downhill after that, huh? But that's why Jesus cares. So that we can live in spite of our failures. I hope that this class this morning has encouraged you to trust in the Lord in a deeper way. Maybe to trust in prayer in a deeper way as you've seen Jesus pray. Maybe to trust his word in a deeper way as it is what leads us. It's what helps us fight off the fiery darts of the devil. Maybe it'll help you in some way. Thank you so much this morning.